Hello, Guy Deutscher. No, Dr. Deutscher? Yes. Hi, this is David Bolton calling. Hi, hi. Hi, how are you today? I'm very well. Very well, and you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for agreeing to talk with me. My pleasure entirely. Well, um, if I may, I'd like to get started by just uh, uh, affirming that I am, in fact, recording this conversation and get your permission to do that, and that um, I will transcribe it and get you a copy of it before we do anything else with it. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, Perfect. Okay, that's good. Fine. Thank you. Well, your book is a, is a fascinating piece of work. Um, and uh, one of the places... Well, thank you. <laughs> nice to hear. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's so wonderful to have uh, an accessible volume that helps people kind of put this, put the, the whole the language that we're so immersed in and we often don't see or we so take for granted into into perspective. Yes, that was that was precisely my aim. So I'm uh, I'm quite happy if it actually works. <laughs> um, <clears throat> could I start by asking you to give us a thumbnail of <clears throat> why you do the work you do? In other words, what What's going on inside of you personally that has driven you into the kind of research and learning that results in this work? Um, well, I actually, I, uh, this is something I say in the beginning of, of my book, uh, and I tell an anecdote about uh, trying to learn uh, a bit of Latin when I was a child and, and um, you know, not quite understanding why it all could could have come from, and that's that's uh, that's a, a true anecdote. Um, I, I've just always, since I was a child, just I was fascinated by by how that amazing thing called language could have could have come about, and who was who was there. Um, you know, as I say, well, well, was it some sort of uh, <coughs> prehistoric um, assembly of of um, elders who decided, and all these. Um, Incredibly complex conventions, um, and of course I knew that wasn't wasn't the case. But I just had no idea how you know how it can how it could have could have emerged otherwise. And um, that was really the the main question I wanted to to answer when when I um, started studying linguistics, studying language, and, and that's what's been driving me ever since, I suppose. Mm, that's wonderful. And it's, uh it's common for <clears throat> a lot of people who do special work to have been somehow <clears throat> that it's deeply personal to them. <laughs> that that yes. somehow some experience they had developmentally set them up for that inquiry. Yes, yes. So really, I mean, the book that I've just written, uh, uh, secretly, I was writing it to myself at the age of whatever, um, 17 or 18 or something like this, because I was trying to answer as many of the questions I desperately wanted to know about then, um, and but couldn't find anywhere uh, anywhere who, which would sort of answer them. So um, that I, I'm sort of in some sense closing a circle there. But. Right. I, I, one of the things that first struck me when somebody uh, <clears throat> introduced me to the book by a link, without reading anything about it, <clears throat> um, the the uh, Mankind's greatest invention statement. Yes. Right. That that my immediate response to that was, this is the invention that created mankind. <laughs> like, yes. like somehow yes. that it wasn't the, what, something that mankind had done. It was what what was done that's made mankind. Yes. Yes. And yes. and immediately getting into your book, I found you coming from there and trying to kind of invert the way we think about this a bit. Yes, that's right. I mean, of course, I, I, I say, well, mankind's great in, greatest invention, that's uh, tongue-in-cheek somewhat precisely because of, 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 of what, you, what you just said. It wasn't, it was, it, 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 language was not an invention in, in, in the sense of um, the, the normal inventions that we, we think of, like the wheel or, or, or whatever, email. Um, it, was, it, it, it was a development that... Um, I mean, yes, it is. It is what made us human, as I, as I say in the book. Um, and in that sense, of course, it is our greatest. I mean, it, it, it is our greatest uh, invention, except that it wasn't invented. Um, yeah. And uh, 
I, I suppose, you know, if, if, if you were to ask why it is that language made us human, um, it's Consider I asked it. <laughs> um, it's, um, I don't think there's a sort of objective or true answer there because, you know, there's not, I mean, uh, uh, <clears throat> there are various things that differentiate us from, from all other animals, um, but um, it must be to some extent a subjective um, decision of what it is we feel that is absolutely most important about us. Um, from all those things that, that, that differentiate us from, from the other animals. And I think most people um, would, would, would agree quite instinctively that, that it's language, that that's the fundamental thing that we have um, that, that, that makes us um, qualitatively different um, from everything else. Um, and and um, at least objectively, we can say that, I suppose, that, that, uh, that uh, as I, uh, I uh, say well, in the book, that everything, I mean, with, it, is, it is clear that without language, we just couldn't, couldn't have done everything else that we have done. Um, so could we speak for a moment? I mean, I, 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 I'm with you in language being that attribute. You know, that's, that seems pretty clear. And, and yet there seems that there's also something that's showing up just before that, which is the, the human ability to learn together that's kind of mediating the emergence of our use of language. Um, the ability to learn together, um, you mean to, to transmit knowledge from generation to generation? Um, and, and from person to person, from being to being, that, that our, our, we, we've, we're on this track of learning together that um, in some ways is driving the emergence of language. I mean, it depends. Where, where do we say um, early communication interactions between primates um, cross the line to becoming language in humans? Well, that's, that's the... Um, that's the greatest unknown. Um, that uh, would have been absolutely amazing if we could if we could know that. Um, but the, the the fact is that between w we know today that that um, primates um, can communicate in a, in a much more sophisticated way than than we'd ever imagine. You know, with Kanzi and, and um, but uh, there still is is a huge gap. Um, between the most sophisticated things that we, we've seen um, bonobos or chimpanzees doing and what every human child is doing. Right, um, right. And bridging that gap, I mean, obviously that is something that, that, that was uh, a, a long evolutionary historical process, but we have, we have um, very little... Um, you know, we have very little to go on if we, when we're trying to reconstruct it. Of course, there have been um, um, you know, hundreds of, of, of scenarios. Um, um, Proto languages evolving. You mean kind of? Um, yeah, I mean even before that, the, you know, from gesture to to language, and from 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 music and, and rhythm to language, etc. Um, and uh, but it's not it's it's very difficult to uh, b because we have so little evidence it's very difficult to put a a precise point and say this is where um, language began right so, and I don't mean to go too far into this but it <clears throat> it d does seem that there's some what is it uh, one, one genetic study and then anthropological uh, records relative to the change in jaw and teeth and tongue and so forth necessary to produce rapid articulate speech as we think of it today um, yes. seems to have a you know 50,000 to 200,000 year window or something. That's right um, uh, but e even these they're not conclusive in a sense I, I think w what you're referring to is probably the um, studies about the, the lowering of the larynx um, um, were um, <coughs> part of the, the we, we have a much lower larynx than than um, chimpanzees, I and mean, that that enables us to produce a much wider range of sounds. Um, uh, and and uh, but but that was the the um, 
you know, anatomically modern humans with, 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 with precisely the same anatomy as ours have been around for, for well, between, any, well, tw- maybe 200,000 years or, or at least 150,000 years. Right, right. So that's, that's the old... Um, but when we talk uh, about 7 million years or so of human, you know, history, evolutionary history as we define the species or whatever that number is... Precisely. So the, the language thing is still a relatively new blip in all of that. Uh, well, no, but the, 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 the thing is that even, um, you know, that's... Uh, even... Uh, um, well, even... even uh, um, a higher larynx, so even uh, even hominids who had a much um, <coughs> narrower um, possibilities to to produce sounds could still produce quite a sophisticated language. I mean, uh, uh, we have we could easily have uh, um, uh, you know there are language even languages even today which practically, for example, have um, only one or two different um, meaningful meaningfully different vowels. Um, mm-hmm. Um, so, the fact that, uh, say, um, our ancestors 500,000 years ago couldn't produce the vowel um, E is, uh, um, well, it is indicative of something, but it certainly doesn't tell us directly how much language they had. Right, right. Um, the, the thing so I was referring to is more that there seems to be a period in time where uh, it becomes apparent that language itself was being selected for in how our structure started to, you know, uh, adapt to producing language. That, that there seems to have been some kind of a, uh, you know, a window in which that seems more apparent to us in the yes. anthropological record. That's, that's a very, I think that's a very plausible assumption, a uh, plausible scenario, but it's not there's no it's not conclusive. direct evidence for it. There's no, no direct evidence for anything to do with language. Right. Um, before 5,000 years ago, which is, you know, well, it, it starts it, to get it's, it's absolutely ridiculous in, 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 in the time scale we're talking about. Yeah. Um, everything before that is, is um, speculation, of course. I, I, I very, um, very much like uh, the type of speculation of, of, of Deacon, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but it, I mean, one must always remember that it is still speculation. Right. Um, right. Okay, well, let's move from there. I just wanted to touch on that. I mean, I think the thing that, um, on the one hand, we're saying what really makes us human in the ways that we most appreciate humanness today begin with language, that they're so kind of built on language, and that... Um, the thing that's most interesting to me about this progression is that it would seem that there must have been a time when language was was more um, external utility communication um, mechanism medium than the kind of uh, internal self reflexive you know self talk yes. that goes on today that yes. makes yes. our consciousness so different than anything that ever existed. I, I agree entirely. I, I, I agree entirely that the only thing is how exactly that um, that transition um, occurred is, I, I think, is something we will never. Right, right. Um, and without needing to pin it down scientifically, it, and, and, and without bringing any kind of a religious charge to this, it's interesting that there, you know, there's, there's mythical notion that in the beginning is the word. Yes. Yes, that there's, a, there's a connection there somewhere, um, and and uh, I think I think that we sort of instinctively feel that not um, not necessarily the historical process, but just by defining ourselves. That what we, that is we feel it about the beginning of our of ourselves. Uh, even now, this is this is the beginning of our identity. Right. Um, so it's. It's ultimately a subjective statement, uh, a, a statement about feeling, but uh, it, it must it must also reflect in, in in some sense a historical reality. But the 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 details of which are, I think, will will forever be uh, well, a mystery, a conjecture at least. So where we may not be able to uh, pinpoint with any accuracy that we'll ever be satisfied with some ignition point to this as if it was a singular event rather than a really gradual emergence, which, you know, it's, as you say, we can't really tell. Yes. Nonetheless, there's something that we can say about how language 
bootstraps itself into greater complexity, how it, how it's grown. Yes. And, um, and that's really the core of your book. That's precisely what I try to do, yes. And so I try to start from a point where one could say it's a, a fairly late point already in, 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 in that, um, if you talk about the whatever seven million year time span, then it's, it's probably a fairly late period. Uh, um, but at least it's the it's it's the it's the part of the story that we can uh, well then we can make reasonable conjectures about that we can know well we can make uh, inferences based on how it looks today precisely yeah exactly. so that's why that's why I I, I started to um, I I decided to, to start there. Um, and then we can precisely, based on, on what we, we can see today, we, we can actually, um, I think, build fairly uh, plausible scenarios for, for how it could have, um, how from a, 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 a very simple beginning, which is still, I mean, it would still be, probably we would, I mean, the, the stage where, where I choose to start with, which I call Meetalsen, um, I think we should set, certainly um, agree that that is already human, uh, right. and certainly I, I um, um, because if you if you have that sort of basic ability to describe things, um, even if they're very very simple, uh, and uh, also the the assumption um, that you would like to describe and that you would like to communicate with other. With other members of your group, um, uh, vocally, th then that's that's already that's already, I think, um, human. But um, if you think about the te the, the technique of, of language, um, I start with the, the most really the most rudimentary um, materials um, and uh, try to show how using the processes that we can see in operation. Uh, in the historical period and even today, we can um, just extrapolate that back and 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 uh, um, and see how the, the the complexity of that tool, um, namely language, has uh, has evolved. That's the um, the interesting pro process is, is the kind of uh, social cognitive inertia, the like meme-like evolutionary process of how language is differentiated? Um, yes, it is essentially that. It's, it's, the, it's the process um, by which uh, <coughs> ideas or conventions emerge, not because uh, someone decides on them in, um, consciously, but uh, through uh, through the act of communication itself, right. um, through repetition, uh, um, so so it precisely is the is, is the evolution of memes. If 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 one wants to speak about it in these terms, as be as perhaps being driven by um, the economy, expressiveness, and analogy uh, yes. that you were speaking to. Perhaps you could take a. I really liked your short cutters. Um, <laughs> It reminded me of my daughter once who came up with this word, but sept. To mm, mean? Well, it's, it's, it's both the word but, as, as in uh, warning that a difference is coming, and yes. accept. Oh, I see, I see. Yes. <laughs> and she yes. contracted them. And yes. I've always marveled at how little children develop these incredibly intelligent word fusions yes, out of wonderful. fragments that they hear that demonstrate the very principles I think you're referring yes. to. Precisely, no. That that really is a wonderful example. Um, so, yes, I think that the, um, the the three main driving forces for um, for change are um, economy, expressionism, and analogy. And the economy is, is ultimately just this laziness um, that's manifested mostly in pronunciation trying to pronounce as little as possible, uh, as little as you can get, get away with. So it's not uh, trying to optimize so much as it's trying to take the path of least resistance. Um, yes, but uh, of course there is, I mean, no one tries to, no one tries to um, 
optimized from above. No one sort of sits and looks at the at the whole system and then think, well, we have a redundancy here. We have a word that's sort of too long there. Let's 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 sort of do something about it. It's that sort of um, uh, it, it, it's that sort of free market economy. It's, it's the um, uh, things happen through um, uh, things that people do individually and and uh, um, always. Um, trying to address very immediate concerns. Um, so you, you just instinctively try to, you know, you don't want to put any more effort um, than needed for your um, uh, conversation partner to understand you. Um, and you, you don't do that consciously. You, you, um, it, it's a... Uh, uh, well, it, it's... Uh, it's built natural. into the process of trying to keep the flow going. That you're, yes. that yes. you're, yes. yeah. Um, and there is, but, but there is that again through repetition and through uh, continuous um, um, negotiation. In some sense, it, it, it's, it's uh, all, most of it is unconscious, but um, it's still a, a, an act of negotiation. Because if you if you go a, a little bit too far, your partner will not understand you, and so you will have to repeat it. And next time you. Um, you know, you, you won't go just quite as far as you as you did. So, so that's the, 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 there is always that that negotiation between the speaker and the hearer. Um, but the result of this um, uh, over over time and uh, uh, over the society is, is uh, a sort of constant um, drive towards optimization, towards um, uh, uh, well reduction um, and, and making the code more efficient mm -hmm. right yeah uh, it's, um, it's re somewhat reminiscent of uh, Einstein on different levels saying you know make everything as simple as possible but no simpler in terms of the ecology of the yes, dialogue yes, and the conversation yes, yes that's, I, I, that, that's right um, of course there if, if that was um, the only thing um, around then then um, we would get uh, well the, then uh, words would just always get shorter and shorter and shorter and we will um, things would be incredibly efficient but possibly quite dull dimensionally constrained yes um, but there are there are other processes because, or there are other driving forces I should say um, because of course we also want to. I mean, uh, uh, this is analogy. Uh, sorry, this is um, expressiveness. This, this I talk about because we also want to. Um, well, we often want to to uh, extend our expressive range or um, say things in a more forceful forceful way, create a greater effect, um, and that drives us in, in in the other direction. So that drives us drives us towards. Um, Maybe using more words or using words with stronger meaning, um, or, or creating or differentiating more complexity by using words on some stretching edge with who we're with. Um, that's that's yeah that's also yes that, that's that's one manifestation precisely. So we got expressiveness trying to expand, or not trying to, but resulting in some expansion and the economy uh, conserving against that in a way. Yes, I I, I try to I think I try to describe it as, as sort of these um, cycles of um, you know expansion and reduction um, where, where ex uh, this expressiveness um, acts to or, or builds new phrases or longer phrases or more complex ones and then uh, the um, uh, economy or laziness or erosion just sort of gradually reduces them um, uh, and, and one checks the, the excesses of, of, of the other so in, in, in these in these cycles of um, almost speciation. Um, in what, what sense speciation? Well, the, 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 it seems like animals um, um, migrate and differentiate, <laughs> uh, yes. and become different, and then they then they bump back into each other in ways that kind of um, end up with the, the, this greater st uh, base strength surviving rather yes. than the variations on the extremes. Yes. Yes, that's right. Um, so, so in addition to these two, 
and then there's analogy, which is um, that is in some sense, if if there is if there is an element of trying to make order of, of that whole sort of mess, uh, that 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 is analogy, and that is um, the instinctive need to uh, just find as much order as possible, um, especially by children. Uh, in order to cope with learning the language, you, 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 I mean, when when you learn the language as a child, you have to cope with absolutely um, mind-boggling amount of information and detail, um, and it would be completely impossible to do that if you didn't assume, at least as your you know default working hypothesis, that as much as possible um, works by logical or by by by, by rules. Um, and uh, um, that is why children, but but not only children, we, we, um, uh, whenever they um, are confronted with new forms or new expressions, they they try to fit them into some either rules that they already know or or make rules on the spot based on on similarities between forms and expressions that they they already know um, and most of the time they get it right in the sense that, that they create the same rules or regularities that are really there in, the, in, in their in, in the language of their parents but sometimes they don't um, and, and then we get all these um, um, cute errors that they make uh, uh, yes. and uh, these are just always, they're, without exception, they are always. Um, they always come from a place of of making, for example, something regular, where in in real language it happens to be irregular, or um, at least taking uh, one regularity and imposing it in a place where where it, another rule applies. Um, trying to reference what's new to what's known. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. That's, that's and precisely and a, analogy is the, um, the modus of operating that, of, of creating some contextual reference for what's going on now or what's new. Yes, yes, that, that, that's, precisely, that's precisely the case. Um, you, it, it is the ability to find similarities between things that are not identical but nevertheless have some things in common um, and, and, and create, a, um, a, create a rule or a pattern out of that um, to start with and then use the patterns that you already have to new situations or, or new forms that you encounter. Um, that, that, that's what analogy is. And uh, the, the changes in... in um, language over time or the, the, uh, um, are driven by the fact that that um, the the, <coughs> the, the analogy the, the, the analogies that, that every generation makes um, are, are not entirely um, identical to those of the, of the previous generations and they don't generate in the end precisely the same system um, because in the meantime, maybe um, uh, some forms which had been more frequent became less frequent, and so they they don't um, um, the new generation say would not use these forms to draw their analogies, um, or, or the other way around. Um, some forms which used to be quite infrequent have become very frequent. So these are now the dominant ones to to make the patterns on, um, which you showed really remarkably well with some of the ways that words have almost gone 180 degrees uh, over time in their meaning, given um, how they're used across generations. Yes, yes. So these would be, um, these would be uh, the, the, the processes that feed in um, to, then, to that sort of sieve of, of analogy every generation. Um, uh, um, Changes in meanings, changes in frequencies, changes in even in pronunciation, um, and and then the the combination of of these three basic forces, um, each 
uh, pushing in a, in a slightly different direction um, uh, is is what sort of drives language all the time and, and makes it well um, doesn't allow it to to, to stay still um, and and ultimately it, it's what uh, can develop more and more sophisticated grammatical structures um, or, or uh, as well as uh, a wider range of vocabulary abstract terms I mean, as, as I then show in uh, try to show in, in towards the end of the book All right so I, I want to as we come to close in our time I, I really want to touch on that how our language is this medium of exercise for making complex constructed, uh, abstract, you know, um, realities in our minds. Um, but coming right off of economy, expressiveness, and analogy, yes. there's a parallel of sorts between that group and metaphor, destruction, and creation. Yeah? Yes. Um, Maybe we could just touch on that. Okay. Um well, in some sense, I suppose these are uh, the, the um, these are the uh, manifestations or the or the effects of these of um, metaphor is, is a um, form of analysis. manifestation of of um, expressiveness. Uh -huh. um, uh, destruction is a manifestation of of um, uh, economy, and creation is slightly more difficult because it's a, a manifestation of of all these things combined, um, but um, metaphor is, is a manifestation of, of expressiveness because, uh, as I as I try to say, we um, we try to ex uh, extend our expressive range to either, for example, to to abstract concepts. Um, abstract concepts don't just grow on trees; they have to come from somewhere, and the only way to um, satisfy this uh, uh, expressive urge is to use material that's already there and give it and extend its meaning. Um, and the material that's already there are words for for simple things, for for simple objects or simple actions. Um, so, um, metaphor is, is the is the means by which we um, create more more sophisticated abstract vocabulary by by Taking um, taking simpler uh, w words for simpler concepts and and uh, express our analogies through assembling uh, words into metaphors precisely uh, and and use them uh, well as, as 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 images for for more abstract things. Um, um, then uh, destruction is obviously the uh, that, that's quite certain, that's quite simple how it is the manifestation of, of laziness and creation as I uh, well creation is as I said it, it's more complex because it's um, it really is, is the combination of the three so creation as I show um, or the different aspects of creation are, are achieved through um, the three forces uh, uh, combining together, uh, uh, and so, for example, uh, um, expressiveness creating new longer expressions, and then uh, uh, erosion or destruction um, compacting them into a one longer word, um, and then uh, analogy can sort of pick up on. Almost accidental patterns that uh, that that, are, that emerge in these sort of uh, new words and and regularize them into more uh, complex paradigms. So creation is is, a, is the reason why it's uh, it's in some sense more elusive or more mysterious is because it's um is because it's the the the, the, the three um in in very the, the three forces in very particular combination and, and uh, just the right dosages um, coming together. Hmm. When I was uh, you know, 
know, going through that part in your book, it struck me uh, kind of a parallel with something I worked on some time ago, having to do with um, creation being a the 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 process of of resolving our meaning needs. Uh, um, the, the need to um, differentiate meaning. Yes, uh, I think that's certainly part of it. Um, that is, well, I suppose that's mostly manifested in the in expressiveness and uh, and extending the range of of words to uh, what's formulating the analogy yeah uh, right whereas creation can <coughs> it, it can refer is that, if, correct me if I'm wrong here but creation can refer to the uh, growing um, uh, artifacts so to speak that not necessarily the process that drove them. Yes, I think creation is is the is the product um, right. of yeah. things that weren't weren't um, in existence prior to. Yes, but yeah. also um, the the the, the, the um, again uh, no creation is almost a byproduct. Let's put it this way: it's not no one was especially if you talk about grammatical elements so, or, or, or grammatical structures. No one ever sets about to create a grammatical structure because they think, oh well, you know, our language lacks so and so. It's always the byproduct of 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 the of the other of, of the other or, or the combination of these processes. It's it's uh, when, for example, when a, a, um, a, a metaphor is is um, used and reused and, and loses some of its um, original meaning, and what what remains becomes then a, 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 a sort of bleach grammatical element. Um, so it's it's uh, in some sense the, the the well, I suppose it is ironic that the um, creation of of the sophistication of 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 language or the structure of language was. Um, it is always a byproduct. It's, it's always the, the result of, of other things. It's never sort of an, an a, a, the, the immediate end goal that that, result, that that caused it, right? It's not. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Um, one of the things that that we're interested in as we kind of you know connect this up is the the difference between the evolutionary processes of spoken language. And the kind of evolution with an asterisk, more social, technological, cultural um, yeah. evolution of writing systems. Yeah, uh, they're similar in how they're different. Um, but before we get to that, there were some other things about um, <clears throat> the one of the things I was interested in was the relationship between cognates and words uh, as languages differentiated and spread. Mm-hmm. And by the way, as we proceed here, as, as I think you have some sense of, of where we ultimately want to be talking about. Yeah. If there's a if there's a sense that that there's a point that's important to make that I'm not asking a question about, please. Okay. Come <laughs> forth and say, wait a minute, we need to talk about this before we can go talking about that. Okay. All right. I have. I mean, I have a lot of respect for you and your work and where you're coming from. And, and, and what I'm trying to do is to help people understand from many different dimensions language, how important yes. it is to yes. us, how yes. deeply yes. intertwined yes. in everything that we are it is, and, yes. and yes. That, 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 that when we talk about reading and all that connects with that later, we're talking about a, an overlay that's creating a simulated language experience in our minds yes. that we got to understand what the language experience process is in order to understand the other stuff. No, I, I'm entirely with you on that. And I, 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 I think I wrote you, I, I, I looked through your, on, on, on your website and it really is quite a, you know, it's uh, incredibly ambitious um, and, and uh, um, well, I think extremely important. So I, I, I really appreciate what, what, what you're doing. Um, Thank so, you. Anyway, uh, so coming from there, um, what's the pathway through your work? Because it's so rich 
that will help get us into that that level of understanding. And and one of the things that's 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 fascinated me, and that's certainly part of understanding how the oral language and written language uh, split from each other in certain ways, or developed yeah. a fragmentary relationship in yeah. the later European Renaissance, uh, post Renaissance era, etc., is <clears throat> to understand how language itself has differentiated and spread with its users around the world. Yes. Um, well, uh, I, I suppose, I mean, uh, um, you, you, there's very different, uh, I'm not entirely sure which, which I mean, there are very different directions in which one can answer this, but um, the, the, the thing is that Although, I mean, there's an enormous amount of, um, uh, well, regularity or um, uh, order in some sense in the way language changes, that's what I, what I um, concentrate on in the book mostly. But um, in addition to that, there's, there is, there's no denying that there's an enormous amount of, of just sort of completely random or uh, um, changes that can go either way and and, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and ultimately almost a matter of chance uh, and so when uh, uh, any two groups are, are not in contact with one another then um, although we can expect that the sort of the basic mechanism of, of mechanisms of change would, would work in, in a similar way. Nevertheless, there's such an I mean, there, there, there's such an uh, um, amount of noise, so to speak, uh, um, in, in, in the in the processes of change that um, unless the two groups are in, in contact with one another, and so the the, the, the need for communication. Um, keeps the the two groups in in, in t the, the changes in the two groups in tandem. Um, things just sort of drift apart, and that is why I mean that is how um, the, the, that that is the basis of every. I mean that's the basis of of um, linguistic diversity. The, the the real answer to the Tower of Babel story. And, uh, right, the, right. Uh, this connects it, back kind of with this notion of speciation in the sense that the the, the, the one of the one of the um, um, models of thought about this that I've liked is that, you know, like during the Ice Age, we're talking about, you know, a significant part of the population for a long period of time, you know, living in, a, in relative isolation from, from a, another massive dimension of humanity, and that over long periods of time, forced into pockets that aren't interacting with one another, they're going to develop really different languages. Yes, that, that, that must be, I mean, that's I mean that just must be the explanation, or it is the explanation, and it's no wonder that in, um, you know, the the the, the uh, highest density of of different languages in the world is in Papua New Guinea, um, where I can't actually offhand remember the number now, but but um, there is a joke that uh, um, <laughs> that uh, uh, half of the world's languages are in Papua New Guinea. That's not that's not actually. I mean that's that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's not so far off. Um, and the reason there is, is precisely because you have um, these uh, um, uh, small isolated groups living in in these valleys between um, with with um, mountains around them that that are um, that, that they just don't that they can't um, go through, and so they have um, you know each group in isolation has. Developed independently, and and uh, and that's why there's so many very very different languages around there. Um, right. I mean, just uh, before the Tower of Babel story, um, and and it's, there's an analog to it in every one of the world's major mythologies, is the story of people coming together that um, are similar but different. Right. The, the fruit of the worship of knowledge and the fruit of the worship of ignorance and the Upanishads and Indian traditions or the sons of God and the daughters of men, yeah. suggesting that they have this kind of biophysical compatibility and connectability, but they can't communicate with each other. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, yes, I would say. 
so anyway, that's a that's an important kind of backdrop to the um, to one part of the story. But re going forward from here, one of the things that's 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 particularly in interesting is how the languages in um, the world today have kind of come through this tree, this Indo-European manifold of differentiation. Yes. Um, well, uh, Indo-European, of course, is just one family. I mean, it's right. of particular importance to um, to English speakers um, because it's it's the family that English happens to belong to, and of course, it it uh, because of um, obvious political reasons, it, it it has spread to every corner of the globe. Um, but uh, um, of course, it, it is just one family, and there there are quite a few other families. Right. Um, but in each one of them, um, you can—I mean—you can see similar processes that uh, the, um, uh, of of uh, whenever I mean you have no one knows precisely. Well, if, if we take the the Indo-European family as, as an example, no one knows precisely when when they were one one group and where they were. Um, there, there are different uh, uh, different assumptions about. Where they came from, whether it was um, you know Asia Minor or, or um, Siberia or somewhere in the sort of, uh, Caucasus, um, but uh, wherever it was, I mean, the, uh, what is clear is that then they they sort of split up and and and, and spread or started spreading um, uh, all the way from from what is now India to to Western Europe. Um, and in that process, as they lost contact with with one another, their languages started to diverge. Um, the same we see the same the same process in 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 essentially all other language families. That the the reason why they are families is because they uh, go back originally to a um, one uh, one group, um, but uh, because of geographical uh, dispersal. Uh, 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 over time, you, the, the, the language is just starting to diver start to diverge from one another. Um, so, what uh, holds the commonality is, is that they share certain implicate roots uh, or cognates in the in, in in even though they have different ways of expressing that in sound. Is that right? Well, cognates are uh, they are. Um, uh, the cognates could be shared across language families, but there's something co-implicate that's deeper than the surface sound representation of a word that's shared. That's what's making it uh, participate in a fa in a unique family group, right? That's that's right. But it's um, in some sense a family group is a you know it's it's a, a scholarly um, creation um, in 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 the sense that. Uh, you know, and English English is is Indo-European and Persian is Indo-European, but speakers of English and speakers of Persian can't understand a single word of what. Uh, um, right, uh, right, 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 right. Uh, but, so, but 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 yes, linguists can know, piece together that, that 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 these two languages are expressions that are sitting atop of uh, an evolutionary process that that that's shared. That that well, yes, that's that's true. I mean that they they both ultimately derive from the same language, but they have. Uh, developed in their separate ways for uh, you know many thousands of years, and cognates are, in some sense, just the things that uh, happened to to stay or to to preserve or to well to to remain from that uh, common source in spite of all the um, or that, that can still be um, recognizable. Or, 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 uh, or recognizable relics of that common source, um, at least recognizable to scholars. They're most often not recognizable to to the speakers themselves um, because the sounds have actually changed so much. But um, scholars who, uh, uh, well, who, who, who can sort of retrace, words. The, yeah. retrace the evolutionary process can 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 still recognize that um, these two words come from the same original source and in that sense they're cognate so so it's uh, it's, it's what what 
what remain or what remains uh, in spite of all the changes in some sense. Um, these are the cognates. I'm not sure whether that makes. Am I making myself clear? Oh yes, yes. And I really appreciate your distinctions. So, um, I mean, cognate in some sense is, is uh, I mean, it is just a, a technical term um, in used by linguists to do, to uh, to um, refer to words in different languages from the same family that that uh, go back to the same source. Yeah, I, in a, uh, another language, I would think of them as, um, you know, co-implicate uh, assembly components. Yes, yes. Um, Meaning that they're implicate across different language systems means that those, that they're, um, they're kind of shared ingredient. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Um, so up to this stage where we're talking now about how language um, differentiates or becomes uh, uh, apparently distinct to the non-scholar anyway um, in the different regions in the world that are stabilized and had various degrees of uh, um, isolation from one another. Yes. Um, up to that point, and when we just kind of jumped over the Tower of Babel piece, which, which is interesting, is there is there something about that process to that stage that you think sticks out in your mind um, that the lay public doesn't understand? I mean, if there's, if there's something we're missing in our general, you know, paradigms about all this that 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 the kind of work that you've done and the kind of work that linguists do. Um, um, that's a good question. Um, Well, I think perhaps what um, maybe may a question of dialects and, and language is something that people are, uh, or, or, or that sort of point in, in speciation, as, as you said before, where where um, people tend to think that there's a sort of some mysterious point when, um, say, what used to be the same language changes into two different languages. Uh -huh. um, Whereas I think, in fact, linguists know that this isn't, I mean, it isn't the case. It's not, uh, it's, uh, it's essentially a, a, a continuous process. And there are, uh, essentially, if, 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 if two varieties, let's, let's put it um, that way, in order not to call them either dialects or languages, two varieties, uh, are not in, in in close enough contact with one contact with one another. They they will gradually drift apart. Um, um, and there is no such thing as as um, uh, say 100% um, mutual comprehension suddenly becoming 0% mutual comprehension. What, There's what no singularities here. No. Um, and, and we can see that in, you know, you can see that in even in English dialects. If I mean the, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, well, what was it? There's a, a joke about I think an American and the, uh, uh, an American and maybe an Irishman or American and and, and a Scot or something like who meet somewhere and can't understand a word of what each other is saying, and then in the end they decide to speak French. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and uh, you know, in, in English, but but in in, in um, many other languages, it's, it's it's similar. I mean, in German or French, uh, it, it, you you get you you certainly get dialects of what's supposed to be the same language, which um, are mutually almost entirely incomprehensible. Um, so you, you get the whole range of, of, of from from hundred percent com um, comprehensibility to to almost zero, um, and then you have uh, uh, languages which are officially meant to be separate languages, like, like the Scandinavian languages, um, say between uh, Norwegian and Swedish, there's a, a fair amount, I mean, sadly, more than 50% um, 
uh, mutual comprehensibility, although um, they are officially different languages. So um, the distinction when you decide to uh, call a different variety a different language is to a large extent arbitrary and depends on many other I mean, political or to do with the convenience of the researcher, or the uh, yes, or, or the feeling of the actual. I mean, you know, the feeling of the actual people, um, or mm-hmm. what they whether they want to be a different, to, you know, to speak a different language. Um, uh, like but, perhaps when the the English re- tried to recover uh, English language um, from the you know leftovers of the French in the 14th uh, century. Yes, yes, or, or you know more modern examples are. Serbo Croatian, which used to be a one language in, in, in uh, when Yugoslavia was one country, and after the, the war, um, just suddenly became two languages. Um, nothing actually has, has changed in, in terms of the, the you know the real linguistic situation. They still can understand each other perfectly, but now they they believe or they feel that they speak different languages. So so they call it different languages. Um, but uh, um, the, the, the important thing is that you know gradually, when when two varieties um, are not in contact, they gradually diverge, and so the mutual comprehensibility decreases. And if you wait, I don't know, a thousand years, then uh, then you you are Tower of Babel. Sure, <laughs> yeah, you can be sure that you'll get incomprehensibility. But between you know before that, you get all these shades. In, 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 in between, and what, what you decide to call them is, to a large extent, extent arbitrary. I think that's something that um, people are not always aware of. Right. Right. Well, that's helpful. I, I have a sense, um, wrapping this section, that we could say that language is always on the move. It's always a, a dynamic process that's got creative and destructive elements. It's always... Um, changing. And the, the, the issue is whether or not um, people are, sta- whether or not languages, or people that are uh, engaging in languages are staying in the right, not the right, but staying in relationship with one another sufficient for the languages to be co-evolving or yes, that's people's exactly. use of language to be co-evolving rather than separately evolving. Precisely. That's, there's no way. I can't put it any better. Okay. So, it's amazing again that there's such a parallel in the workings of this process with the way life itself works. It seems. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I, 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 I just laughed. I agree. The uh, one of the things that I particularly want to get to is the, as we said, the, the difference between the writing and the spoken. Yes. Yes. And uh, there's one other piece that I thought might bear on that, which has to do with um, Deacon's notion, not to be putting Deacon anywhere in particular, but I thought it was an important piece when I, did, when I encountered it, which is that languages uh, are constrained in their range and growth and what have you by how learnable they are to children. Yes. Where writing systems are almost the opposite. We'll come to that one. We don't need to put those together right now. We'll put the writing system aside. But to that statement that that that, that it's generational. Language has got this uh, generational evolutionary dynamic in it that's constrained to its learnability by children. Yes. How does uh, that work? I, 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 I entirely agree. I really like this. I think this is one of the. I mean, it's well, it's it's. Uh, one of these things that sounds so simple and so obvious, um, but uh, you know, once once someone has sort of explained them in the way Deacon has, um, uh-huh. but uh, which which is that, uh, and you think, well, you know, how of course it's this way, um, but but then it needs someone to actually have said it. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, um, no, I, th- I think that's that's. Uh, um, that's that's entirely 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 correct and 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 it, it's an extremely powerful explanatory mechanism um, to you know which for, for the evolution of language in general which which 
in some sense puts the whole you know the, there was the, the, the whole debate um, of why the, 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 the children manage to learn language if it's so complex um, uh, and, 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 and that argument puts the puts the situation on its head in some sense because it said well language uh, only those langu- or, or only those elements or those rules or, or uh, in language can survive that uh, are learnable um, so it's not that um, uh, uh, so it, it's not uh, 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 so it's not surprising that children can learn language uh, so effectively and so so quickly in some sense and so early because uh, the things that they couldn't learn um, are not part of our language now. They died off. They were, yes, <laughs> they were, yes, they were adaptations yes, that didn't yes, take for yes, exactly that reason. Precisely, yes. So, yeah. so I, I, I really admire that argument. Okay, good. Um, and I also, and I, I never thought about this before, but it's it's true that you, uh, unfortunately, you cannot apply it in, in such a simple way to, the, to writing because... Um, uh, well, I suppose because writing is is uh, not really well, language. <laughs> well, that's also true. But no, you could apply it, of course. I mean, writing system that is truly unlearnable, that no one would be able to learn, um, would not survive. That's that's um, that's. Uh, uh, I think that is true. Right. But right. A you. writing system which um, requires, you know, which is uh, requires. Years of of um, hard work and uh, frustration and, and and energy and um, and whatever um, uh, obviously can can um, be perpetuated because that's what we have. Because it, 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 it's it's learned at a at a later age where you actually can force people. To, I mean, you can't force two year two year olds to learn to speak. Um, it's 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 not you know you, you, it's not a uh, it's not it's not an option. It's going to happen. It's, they're going to they're going to grow to uh, participate in the patterns of language around them. Yes, but uh, what I mean is, suppose you now you you um, devise a language that's almost unlearnable to speak, you know, and and you try to force your two-year-olds to speak it and what what can you do you can sort of tell them you know if you don't start speaking it I I won't give you any food or I'll beat you or (laughs) whatever you want but that won't help you because if you know at that age if they learn it they learn if they can learn it they learn it if they can't they won't Um, but 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 with writing it's it's different because that's something you do later and and you indeed that's what you do you 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 force you force people who are already at at an age when they when the whole system of, of social coercion is in place and, and is workable. Um, and, and, and that is why writing, I mean, the writing systems can allow themselves to, to have so much more unnecessary uh, complications and, and difficulty than, than spoken language. I, I haven't thought about it in, in this way before, but it's, it's, uh, I, I think that's, um, the parallel between these two in this sense is, is quite striking. Oh, sorry, the lack of parallel between these two. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the sense that clearly the, um, the writing systems that we have have different kinds of uh, confusions in the relationships amongst their elements than the kinds of confusions that exist in the purely oral spoken language. Yes, um, and some of them um, uh, are even intended. Um, I mean, the the, the, the language I I, I mean, the, the languages I, I specialize in are the um, you know ancient languages of Mesopotamia, the, the uh, or Akkadian or Babylonian, um, which we you know were one of the earliest ones to be written. And when you look at the history of of, of the writing of, of these languages, you actually see how um, the, the 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 writing system became more and more and more and more complex, not simpler and simpler. Um, and the reason for that is also fairly obvious, and uh, that it wasn't the interest of anyone uh, 
that it would be, be um, simple in, in, in the, quite the reverse. It was um, people who could uh, reading and writing was was uh, limited to a small group of of scribes um, who were sort of guild, um, and to be to be, to to, be, uh, to, you know, to go to a scribal school, you usually had to be either uh, well to do or the coming from a, to come from a family of scribes, etc. And, and once you became a scribe, have learned all the, the, the uh, to read and write, then, you know, you, your, your future was, uh, you know, your economic future was um, secure. So there was no, um, they, they certainly didn't want to make it simple so that anyone would be able to do it. It was in their and interest, the complexity served their interest. Complexity served their interest, and that's why, with time, you can actually see it becoming more and more complex. They, they invented more and more signs. They um, uh, uh, tried to write things in a, in, a, in, a, in a less and less obvious way, in more and more uh, 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 arcane way, quite often. Um, so that um, you know, by that's 500 BC, when when which is already after 2,000 years of, 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 of written history. Um, the system is, is really has become extremely complex, much, much, much more complex than it was at 2,500 BC. Right, right. The uh, particular kind of complexity that I'm interested in is the complexity in that's unique to the, the alphabetic languages in terms of the relationship between letters and sounds yes. that renders the pronunciation-based recognition of the word immediate, comparatively immediately transparent yes. as distinct from obscure because of the complex relationships between letters and sounds and the time it takes the brain to work all that out. Like, yes. there, that's a different form of confusion that in the work that we've been pursuing seems to have come about because of the a fusion of um, the you know one group of spoken languages with another uh, spoken and written system um, <clears throat> that for the reasons you were describing about language there was nobody you know paying any attention to yes um, I think I mean I I I, 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 I don't know very much at all about all the, the, the psychological aspects behind it, but uh, it's. Um, it, it, I think it's clear that with the, with the, um, well, with the advent of writing, then you, you essentially have, or well, emerging a, a different, a different kind of language, um, uh, that's written language. It's 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 certainly not the same thing, and. It has never been the same thing. Um, people usually say or think that, well, written language is different because it's it's conservative and so it's, it, it reflects the situation in in uh, earlier days. Of course, that's that's partly true. I mean, it, it is true that um, written language is more conservative, but um, it is, I think, a mistake to think that. The written language of today uh, represents the spoken language. Uh, I mean, written language as it is today represents spoken language uh, as it was. As it was, that that is not the case. Right, that's um, just grossly it, oversimplistic. Yes, um, written language has it's always had its own rules because it's it's a different medium. It's a different way of expressing. As we know now that uh, you know that the, they are. Um, I'm not actually here speaking about about the pronunciation, but about the structure of sentences, um, the the sort of uh, um, the well the uh, well, structure of sentences which which is which has always been different in in the written language from the spoken language, and, uh, and the density of of written language, which is all I mean, which has always been more dense than than spoken language. Um, but in um, well, in in pronunciation or in in the in the in the sound system, um, 
but I, again, I think it's, it's something I mentioned in, in the book that there, well, uh, in English at least, that's not, it isn't something that uh, anyone has intentionally tried to make uh, obscure or difficult, um, as, as was the case in, in you know, in, in, in Babylon. It's uh, uh, there, I think it is more, more um, case of, of uh, spelling conventions simply not keeping up with changes in pronunciation um, and so the, uh, um, uh, they just misrepresent the, the, the situation today I mean there would be quite a good representation of the situation in the, in the 16th century right 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 we've uh, talked to a number of different people in this particular space about how the English writing system comes in with uh, the chancery scribes, or comes back, let's put it that way, after the French uh, domination, um, with the chancery scribes and how that gets picked up, and uh, then the great vowel shift hits and the printing press yeah. comes in, and all these things are kind of cementing this still forming slush before it got, um, before it cleaned itself out, you might say. But my concern, stepping back one, for one step for a moment, was when we talk about the kind of confusions that are frequently found in writing systems, I think that there's a distinction between once I'm able to read, once the words are transparent, I can get them, then I step into the field of the written world's complexity. But before I get to a point where those words are popping that way, I'm not in that field of complexity, I'm at this interface level of complexity between the sound system and how my early learnings of the writing system have to evoke that sound system. Right. So, so, so you mean um, there's, there's an expectation that once you can just translate sounds into uh, sort of letters into sound, um, you should be able to understand written language. Yeah, not at all. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying. No, I, I'm saying there's. Um, uh, that is not true, but but uh, what were you saying that th this is this is the false expectation, or were you? Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm trying to say that there's a unique class of challenge associated with getting past the letter sound barrier to a point where the word recognition is happening automatically and transparently, and right, then you I can see. go on into the other unique to writing types of complexities and confusions. Yes. But that right there at that boundary is where, for example, in the United States, about 100 million people are being held underwater. At, 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 the, at the stage between um, word recognition and, um, and, and the higher complexities. Yes, yes. yes. That, that it's taking up so much. Um, it's so taxing to punch through the confusion. I mean, and this is one of the interesting things. I mean, my understanding is, is that during the uh, initial use of the alphabet by the Hebrews, there's like 17 consonants in play, and, and there's a pretty tight correspondence between letters and their sounds. When the uh, Greeks get it from via the Phoenicians, and I know there's some argument to what extent the Egyptians are, you know, who's playing what role here, but, but when the Greeks get it, within a reasonable period of time, the Greeks, in some way, looking out for the Greek language, adjust the alphabet so that it has the additional symbols so it can represent their language. Yes. The Romans inherit that with minor tweaks to punctuation and other aspects of it to make it better fit for them, yes. and spread it around Europe like the World Wide Web or OS of the Empire. Yes. When they wither away, the powers in Europe living in the different regions and different languages continue to regard it as the power language, the in language, the, the language of knowledge and science and God and everything else. Yes. Um, but at some point, the writing system, based on that sound system, gets overlaid on top of the local spoken languages. Yes. And at that point, a confusion comes in that's unlike what happened when the Greeks get the alphabet 
from the Phoenicians because nobody's saying, wait a minute, let's adjust this thing so it fits yes. our language here. Well, it's, I don't, it's not entirely true that nobody, I mean, in England, well, um, some, uh, some, for example, in, in, in some countries, eventually additional letters or additional, uh, well, I suppose additional letters were, were um, devised to, to put, you know, precisely in order to represent sounds that weren't um, there in, in the Roman system. So, you know, in, in you have all the diacritics and in, in all the, the umlauts in German, all the um, accents in French, um, and you have various uh, um, in, 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 in uh, uh, mechanisms for stretching, for connecting the spoken language to the in, in legacy system of uh, Roman writing. Yes, yes, by essentially extending it, but not not by uh, devising a whole new alphabet, but by extending the the, um, uh, the Roman alphabet in order to um, uh, adapt it to to, right. to represent uh, the the. the the sound system of the particular languages, and some languages have done it quite, uh, quite effectively. When I, when, you're right. When I said no, and I was really referring to England, and, I, and I, yes. I'm aware of a number of attempts at orthographic reform and certainly spelling reform and such. But, but, but my understanding is is that it, it, it looks like a small number of scribes who grew up in the Latin school, who spoke primarily Latin, um, who were proud of their Latin and living in kind of an elite bubble um, are the ones that figured out how to take the, you know, the English spoken system with its 40 plus sounds and represent it as close as possible with Latin yes. sounds in a yes. 24 something yes. letter alphabet. Yes. I mean, I don't know enough um, uh, to, to, to tell whether um, this was some sort of um, decision made by a sort of arrogance, so we are sort of very Latinate in this, or we'll do that, or whether it was uh, simply lack of imagination or lack of, uh, I don't know, intellectual... Well, yeah, uh, without, horizon, without whatever, imagination. To say we can actually, you know, we, we, we can do things differently and not... Uh, but, you know, it, it, it is partly... I think it it's, uh, must be a similar symptom to the to the phenomenon that was what was uh, common until fairly recently of of teaching English grammar as if it was Latin because oh well grammar is Latin and therefore we shall uh, pretend that, that English is Latin in order, I mean teach the grammar of it as if it was Latin and which is utterly ridiculous of course but, yeah. uh, but it I think it's it's uh, that was well, a prestige inheritance right more than yes, than yes but it might not be even such a well I mean it, it might not be a uh, not a uh, I mean the the most uh, what I'm trying to say is the motives may not be I mean they may simply be a, a inability I, inability to imagine that things can be otherwise because right, of this right. enormous prestige it might not be a it might not have been a uh you know, might not, I don't think they were. Uh, I don't know. Um, Arrogant elitism. Not I'm not trying. To, anyway, I, yeah. I, I'm not trying to so much impute that anyway, mm -hmm. as to say that, look, if these weren't people that were living out amongst the English-speaking population and engaging with them, you know, frequently and enjoying and appreciating the English language, but were living comparatively cloistered, uh, separated lives. Um, speaking to one another and doing their day-to-day -day functions in Latin, then they're going to, they're certainly going to have trouble rounding the corners of stretching the um, alphabet and the sound system they're using to capture sounds and uh, distinctions in the spoken language that they're not participating in that much. Yes, I agree entirely. Although, I mean, it is interesting that in, in previous uh, uh, Stages of English, there were some attempts to to introduce um, other sounds. So in Old English, you have the the um, uh, the, the sounds for the and the. the. There were two other letters, um, and then in Middle English, you have this um, yog yog um, letter that looks a bit like a, a cross between a, a G and a Y, and that was uh, used to to um, to represent the sound ch. Um, 
but but uh, uh, which for the most part get dropped when the printing press guys don't have fonts for those things, right? Yeah, that's right. Even yeah. though the scribes uh, used them, which meant that the scribes actually had more tools to reconcile the, the you know the gap. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. In a way, so, what seems interesting to me is, is that. Um, the original writing systems developed and adapted, at least the alphabetic ones, in environments where the spoken language had phonemes of a particular number that was roughly correspondent to the particular number of alphabet characters in use, and that the kind of processing task associated with matching up a uh, alphabet and sound system that don't have that match um, isn't a unique kind of processing challenge never before experienced by human beings. Um, that might well be the case um, in, in the sense that uh, what happens here is, 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 is unusual in that the writing system pretends to represent sounds, whereas in fact it doesn't. Um, with where, where previous writing systems um, you know, which were very difficult, but at least did not pretend. Is that what you're saying? Right. Or in the case of, uh, there's a quote from Plato in the Republic where he says, uh, you know, once we knew the letters of the alphabet, we could read. That there's a difference between see a letter, articulated sound, blend it with the next one, and this kind of uh, pitching machine automation that results yes. in intelligible, recognizable speech stream. Yes. As distinct from um, letters that that are more like uh, uh, placeholders for variable fields <laughs> yes. that, that change yes. what their sounds are depending yes. upon, you know, letters far away from them. No, yeah, that, that's. That, I think that's more or less the same as what what, what I meant uh, in the sense that in 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 Greek or Latin, say, and uh, um, indeed, once you could, once you knew the letters, you could you could read, uh, you you could read the sound. I mean, you you could get the sound. Um, but in, in, in some pre or even today in, in, in uh, things like or in, in Chinese or in uh, uh, there are some writing systems that are traditionally known as very complex because they don't even pretend to represent. Them. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, um, I'm, we're tracking. Chinese yes. or like the Egyptian system. Oh, well, okay, the Egyptian is is, is complex, but but like uh, um, the the Mesopotamian cuneiform system, which uh -huh. which had sounds as well, but had uh, an enormous range of, of uh, you know, logograms, words for, uh, 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 signs for, for whole words. Um, so they didn't even pretend, whereas then, uh, as I say, came the, uh, okay, let's leave the, the Canaanite or the, the, the Hebrew alphabet for a moment, but uh, in Greek and in Latin where there was this sort of perfect match. Um, and, and, uh, and what happens in English today is that you, there's still the the pretension that it's it's a it's a system representing sounds, um, but in fact it, it is it isn't the case anymore. It, it isn't, and yet for children coming up into it, somehow they are got, to it expect got, that it, 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 it should be, and it somehow it's got to function that way too, even though it doesn't. I mean, the, 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 for though a good reader transcends the sound barrier and is picking up words and recognizing them without the subvocalizations, without it going yes. through the, the yes. phonological loop, yes. for children who are learning to get up into it, it's got to translate into sound. Yes. Before it can go on to 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 go beyond sound. Yes. Yes. So I mean, I, I think it is true that in English English readers, I should say. Um, have a much more difficult task than um, than um, those in, in in countries like Germany or Hungary or uh, Scandinavian countries or even Netherlands, where there have been consistent spelling reforms uh, to uh, um, uh, make sure that that. Uh, uh, that the writing does represent the, the sound system of the language in, in a fairly transparent way. Yes, excellent, excellent. Uh, I'm really enjoying our conversation, and yes, I had, I? I had, uh, what I'd like to do is to either ask permission to have a part two at a later date, and or call you back in 
15 minutes and and have a part two later tonight if it's not too late for you. Um, uh, no, it's, it's fine. Yes, it's fine. Would you prefer that I call back in a few minutes? Uh, yes. Okay, then let's take a break okay. for 15 minutes um, while I, I wasn't sure what our length was going to be and I didn't want to impose or intrude on your time, but I'm really enjoying the conversation and we're just getting into some I mean, all of it's been very, very rich. And this space here and and how these two systems work together and what you've learned about language that can shine a light on that is really important. Um, I'm Well, I'm enjoying it as well, and I'm glad it's, 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 uh, it's helpful. But sure, sure I mean, I'll, I'll be here. All right, very good. Okay. Thank you. I'll be back to you Bye soon. Bye for now. Bye. Bye-bye. Hello? Hello, it's David again. Yeah, hi. Hi, okay, how are you? Very well. Thank you. Not too much since last time. <laughs> Thank you again for this conversation. I'm really enjoying and appreciating it. So am I. So, one of the things that, uh, in in trying to help uh, us understand this collision of systems, this fusion of systems that has that picks up kind of where we were. That's that's a curiosity that I've had for some time. It has to do with why is it that the English sound system has so many more sounds than the Roman system? Or oh. the, 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 is, that, is that also a, a product of the differentiation happening and mixing? That's a difficult question. That really is a very difficult question. Um, um, I can't remember where I've seen this, but I mean, it, it, it seems that generally in, in the modern European languages, there are, in many of them, there are more distinct phonemes, as uh, as we call them. I mean, mm-hmm. sounds in, in the sense of uh, meaningful, distinction for sound, sounds, right. Um, than uh, the, the were in, um, than there were in Latin, uh, certainly. Um, why is that is, is is not a question. I mean, it's it's well, it, it, it's interesting that I mean, the fact that it's it's the case is already extremely interesting. Um, I think I I, I vaguely remember, and I can try and find it out. Um, reading something very um, provocative. Uh, and, and very uh, um, well, tentative as well, trying to argue that generally um, uh, sound systems have become more complex uh, in, in the last few thousand years, and, and possibly even linking it to more saying that, that uh, sound systems in, in, in more complex societies uh, have become more complex. But uh, I, I don't want to be quoted. On I understand. That. I understand. We're in uh, speculation land together. Yeah, here. there is. I mean, there's definitely someone who's written about it, but I can't. I can't find. I would, I would think when, when when some people's in in language group A start to pick up a lot of vocabulary from group B, that they, though they may have similar numbers of sounds in play, the different sounds required to make the vocabulary coming in from B add sounds to the overall system in play in A, that kind That's of thing. That's uh, undoubtedly one way, and we know that in English, um, uh, uh, some sounds, uh, some new phonemes like um, J, I think, came in, uh, in, in through borrowings. Um, it's not, I think it can't be reduced to that. It, it okay. can't be only that, um, because uh, new sounds, um, we know of, 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 of ways in which new phonemes develop. Um, um, and and they're they're very they're, they're various natural ways in which this can happen regardless of um, of, of borrowing. Um, just as one simple example, um, the process that that uh, well in, in in jargon it it, it can be called um, affrication, but uh, uh, the process. Um, by which sounds like p are, are uh, weakened into uh, into into fricative into f, or um, b becomes v. Um, there, 
we know, I mean, there, there are various languages which um, still, I mean, don't don't have uh, such fricatives like f and, and 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 v, and only use the only have the stops p and b, or uh, same with t and s. Um, and then through a very natural process, uh, um, it's part of this erosion or weakening of sound synthesis. Uh, I talked about you, you get you get these new um, you get these these, these new sounds. Um, initially, quite often they're not yet phonemes; they just appear in certain phonetic environments and 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 never are, are never used to make a, 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 a meaningful distinction. But um, but with time, they can once they are established and and appear in more and more contexts, they uh, speakers can can start. Uh, Perceiving them as as actually uh, uh, different sounds, and then and then uh, um, uh, um, meaningful differences. I mean, there can words can emerge which actually have them as as, as a, a meaningfully different element, um, and then they they turn into phonemes. So um, all that long explanation to to cut it or to to. to Summarize it. Uh, what you get is is uh, things that start as just uh, um, effort saving, um, effort saving processes, producing a different sound in some environment, and then gradually that that new sound uh, gets the uh, status of a phoneme. Um, we can see that in in, in many languages, um, not not just in English. Uh, it, it's a very natural process, and this is a way in which a language can can acquire a new sound. Now, sometimes the old sound disappears. So, say in in, in Arabic, um, p has entirely disappeared because all the p's were uh, eroded into s. But in uh, in, in 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 Hebrew, um, which happens to be my mother tongue, um, the same thing happened with with some p's turning into s in some context, uh, and then. Eventually, F is uh, has become a different phoneme. So, so the language started out with only a P, and um, ended up after so and so many centuries with both P and F as distinct sounds. Right. Um, that that is a natural process which doesn't have doesn't need to have anything to do with with borrowing. Right. Um, but uh, it seems staggering in a way that that throughout antiquity, at least to the degree that we could measure sounds with the alphabet and use it as a ruler for sound systems that were probably in play, that we're talking, you know, in the 20-somethings, um, that in Hebrew and Greek and Latin and so forth. And then we jump forward 2,000 years, and in the Northern European languages, there's 40-plus sounds. Yes. I mean, that, that's not a small difference. That's, you know, almost, you know, a twofold growth. Yes. Um, I mean, uh, admittedly, one has to, I mean, one has to uh, um, remember that even, I mean, even in the, the Roman system, in the, in the Latin system, there were some, I mean, I suppose there were long and short vowels, which they didn't really indicate. Um, but uh, so that makes it. A, I mean, that that adds a few to to uh -huh. to, to that. But but the general but the general principle I think still stands that there has been a, a you know a um, a noticeable increase in the inventory of phonemes. That's that's it, it's something that's that's well known. Um, why that is? I mean. <laughs> Uh, it's again one of these things where you can uh, the paths to which that happens are not mysterious at all. Is that's how um, uh, I uh, that's you know what I just explained. But uh -huh. why it is that uh, on the whole, in the sort of looking at globally, that say more sounds have emerged uh, and uh, you know why the balance has has been. Uh, Disturbed in a way because you, because you can say I mean the 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 the, the path to which new sounds emerge are, are well known and and fairly easy to understand. Also the path by which um, some old sounds can disappear, um, like in English the, the, there used to be the ch sound and and that has disappeared from the language. Um, 
but the main question is, you know, th then you, you could expect as a default that just as many, you know, the, the, the overall number of sounds should not change radically. Um, uh, in that, okay, well, some some new sounds gen um, can, can come in, but all, some old ones can 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 disappear. But why why in the history of the of, of the European languages in the last two thousand years, say this, this hasn't been? Um, I mean, the balance has has shifted, and more new sounds came in than old ones disappeared. Is is a is, is a very difficult question. I don't think anyone has. A, I mean, uh, can do more than speculate. And, and the, so the, the thing that I mentioned before is is, a, is, is obviously just a speculation. But um, so it goes there right next to the great vowel shift um, as being a <laughs> lots of theories, but but nothing um, approaching a consensus as to why yet. No, I think it, it is really it is really quite difficult to. Um, you know, we, we are on a quite a different level of explanation here. You know, when you look at, at, at language and you try to explain, okay, well, uh, either how does one thing take change to another, that's usually fairly easy. Or even you can give local, I mean, even why does one sort of sound change into another, that's often also fairly easy I mean, in the sense that you can give uh, a local explanation Usually, it's 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 laziness of one sort or another, as, as I said in the very beginning. So, with P turning into F or F turning into H, or uh, or, or sometimes S changing into R, and all these things, it's it's, it's usually effort saving in pronunciation in certain contexts. So, all these things are fairly straightforward. But when you the explanation we want for this is in a, on an entirely different level. You sort of want to jump. Uh, higher and look at look at sort of the global system and uh, and and see why there has been some sort of upset to the balance balance right. um uh, and that's something uh, i think it's, it's something that stands out in the trajectory of change that preceded it right in terms of just the volume shift yes in the in yes. that short period of time yes um Okay, well, so, we don't need I mean, to pursue it's, it's, it much further. I just thought it was really interesting. And it's when extremely interesting. I agree. I mean, it, it's uh, and it's unlikely to be a coincidence in in the sense that it didn't just happen in English. It happened in most, well, I think probably all modern European languages. Um, so something something is happening there. But uh, is, uh, is, it, is it possible? I'm really jumping out on a limb to, and being in just play space with you about this, but. It, one of the things that I've been very interested in throughout the, you know, the work and learning that we've been doing is, you know, it's really clear that the, that the writing system as we use it today, or as I explained earlier, relative to children learning it anyway, sits on top of the sound system. But yes. it's also clear, if we look back through the history of writing systems, that writing systems are now not only extensions of the spoken language system, They've folded back to shape the, the spoken language system in profound ways. That's uh, again. Uh, that's uh, I agree. I agree entirely. Um, so my, where I was going with that is, I'm wondering to what extent, because we're talking about a spike in phoneme growth in the past uh, 2,000 years, which is about coincident with the peaking of the Roman Empire and the introduction of its spoken and written system throughout Europe. Yeah. You know? Um, in other words, is, could writing itself be somehow responsible? The, you know, the coexistence of multiple systems like that, which is more than just borrowing. It's an interesting thought. Um, it's a very interesting thought. Uh, well, I certainly wouldn't want to rule it out. It's. it's uh, Okay, I'm not. <laughs> I don't have any attachment to it other than it seems coincident to me that you know there's this big spike that happens and it happens um, with the um, you know the dissemination of use of the alphabet. Although it's not affecting that many people in yes. Northern Europe, right? But it is affecting the people in power and yes. to some extent people of influence over language. Yes. 
that's that, that, that's true. Although I mean, I don't. I mean, it, it is. I wonder um, whether it is uh, whether whether it is. Well, at least in all, all all languages that we can reconstruct, all European languages we can reconstruct. It is. Uh, Whether I mean whether there's an obvious point, uh, I mean sort of that that spike, or, or whether whether some sometimes it's more gradual. It's actually not something I uh, I can't think of my uh, of my hand very very. Yeah, I didn't bring up clearly. necessarily the spike. Just the, it started with the fact that there is this big difference in number. Yes. And and you referred to um, you know somebody's work that that talked about the last two thousand years being where this where there seemed to be some growth that's you know speaking to this difference in the number of phonemes in northern yes. European languages. So yes. Yes. That just happens to coincide, and that's why I brought it up. Yes. It it. Uh, May well may well be connected. I, I, it's just that um, ultimately, you know, it, it, it's, it's very I mean, it's very difficult to give answers. But yes, I know, I know. Things okay. like this that mm-hmm. I mean, that not related to language, to to writing systems. That as I talk about in the end of the book, that you see um, some obviously directional changes, some things that. Global, you know, global changes in uh, that that do upset the balance of, of of language, or sort of do do move the balance in in a particular direction, and you can see them over the last couple of thousands of years. Um, and well, do you want to share what you thought was the most powerful example in that group? Well, uh, uh, in the European languages, there's a clear movement towards simpler words. Mm-hmm. Simpler and shorter words. If you look at all the older languages, not just Latin and Greek, but uh, I mean, without exception, the, the, the older, oldest, o- older stages of, of all the Indo-European languages, they have very complex words with you know lots of different endings and prefixes, uh, and and much of what is, is done today with separate independent words is was done then in in. Um, in in in, uh, in one word, so they were in, in in the linguistic jargon. They were highly inflected languages, um, and as as uh, history moves forward in in Europe, you just consistently see these getting uh, you know um, words generally becoming uh, turning into uh, invariable words. Uh, so the, the, all these case endings um, gradually disappear. Or most of these verbal endings. They're not um, as multi-ordinal. So, sorry. So you're saying the words become less multi-ordinal. They they have um, um, just one form for each word. Yeah. Rather than sort of um, you know sometimes dozens of different. If you look at at, 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 at verbs especially, then you get uh, literally dozens of of different forms for one. For one root or one verb in 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 the older languages, um, all this sort of what we would in English do with, uh, uh, I have done, I would have done, I should have done, I will have been doing, and all these different tenses, they were all um, expressed in w- within the verb um, right. as one word, and um, and this is one of these. Uh, Again, a sort of thing. It, it can't just be a coincidence because it's happening in in so many different languages. In well, in, in fact, in, in in all European languages, maybe not to the same extent. But uh, but uh, trying to ask why is is again a, a you know <laughs> it's a question that doesn't difficult. go anywhere. Right, right, right. It's extremely difficult, and 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 there are various speculations in in, in different directions. But it's not just like trying to explain one local change or something like this where, where you're you know you, you you're in a completely different level of, of abstraction and and speculation there mm-hmm. and it's I think it's similar with these foul with the increase in the number of sorry in the increase in the number of volumes yeah. right well the main thing that that, that that that's interesting to us is just that there is this gap 
between the, um, you know, the, the graphemes and the phonemes. Yes. That that be, it, it it seems that in a way um, you could say, and I feel this way, that that once you're up and on the other side of it, potentially you could say that the the ambiguity in the writing system is a exercise environment for creative combinatoric abstraction. I mean, that, that there's good sides to its lack of uh, concrete correspondence. Mm -hmm. But uh, but for trying for when you're trying to get up into it, yes, then it's another. It's a, it's an entirely yes. different kind of challenge. I, I agree. I mean, uh, well, although I can't sort of get, I don't think I can get terribly excited about the the, the alleged um, advantages. But I think it's <laughs> ultimate, ultimately, it really is. Um, well, it, it's it's this inherent um, uh, well, it, it's uh, power struggle between the generation in, in the sense that once you've, as you say, once you've um, mastered the system, um, it's not, in some sense, in your interest to change it because you've mastered it, and and, and uh, not only that will mean more work for you to to um, make a sim system simple simpler, but also you've already um, internalized all the sort of system of values that that leads you to think that this is sort of right and traditional and blah blah blah, and so. Uh, uh, you are then, I mean, it, it's the, uh, you are then in, in, in the position of power to impose the same suffering that you had to go through um, on the new generation and the new generation, I mean, it certainly, in, it would be in the interest of the new generation to have a, a more sensible, uh, simpler writing system, but th they are never in, in a position to, uh, to bring this through or impose it. Right. Uh, and and you could see that in I mean in, in, in well I mean recently um, there had I mean there has been a huge debate in Germany about sort of some fairly minor spelling reform um, which were meant exactly to make things uh, less complicated uh, um, easier to learn but there was a, a huge massive. Um, Opposition to this, not just I mean, from writers, from you know, all, all the people who have a, a vested interest in the system as it is, um, because they've learned it, because they value it, and because they value the element of tradition in it, etc., etc. But the the the, um, the result of this, of course, is that that you you perpetuate that um, the the, the, the unnecessary suffering so to speak, right. of, of the learning process on the new generation which doesn't have a say in the matter um, and by the time they do have a say they have switched camps or at least those in the, most those of them or those those who will those who made it through yeah, precisely those and, and those who um, will, will reach um, positions of influence um, so, it, so, so the inertia works against. I mean, like inertia does, and uh, the, this, this I think is is connected to uh, Charles Hockett, linguist, I believe, who said um, it's easier for people to change their religion than their writing system. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I think that that it, it needs. Uh, well, it, it it really would would need um, tremendous political uh, willpower. And the one time that that happened, are you familiar with uh, Theodore Roosevelt 1906 uh, episode? No. Oh, if you're if you're interested, I'll take a couple minutes and share it with you. I think it's one of the greatest stories never told. Um, sure. It has to do with uh, the Melville Dewey, the guy who developed the Dewey Decimal System for libraries, at least yes. used here in America, uh, impresses Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie puts up 
quarter of a million dollars or so in 1903 money. And a uh, organization forms that includes the chancellors and presidents and English department heads of most of the major European and um, most major English and American universities and schools, the major publishers. Uh, it, it has big notable heavyweight names like Charles Darwin and Lord Tennyson and mm -hmm. so forth. And they all get together and they decide that they, they've got to ch fix the spelling. Yes. That it's, it's co causing uh, the uh, English language to be retarded in its imperialistic advance and it's, <laughs> and, and it's limiting, it's causing two, two, two years or more of additional learning troubles yes. for children to come up into it. And, and so um, recognizing how Ben Franklin and Noah Webster and other spelling reformers before them failed, they choose to take a multi-generational approach and convince uh, authors, publishers, and what have you to slowly shift the spelling over a couple of generations. Right. But one of them, the lead, one of the leaders of this, happens to be a friend of Theodore Roosevelt. And one day he goes to the White House and he's telling Roosevelt about this. And Roosevelt apparently had a um, spelling problem. He never, he was not a good speller, and he never felt great about not being a good speller. And so he just thinks this is a great idea. And he issues a president of the United States order to the Office of Government Printing of the United States government that it will now print everything according to these new spelling reforms. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is when Congress is out of session. Congress comes back in session, and they debate it, and they pass a resolution preventing presidents and any <laughs> members of Congress from ever changing the spelling of anything. It gets the Supreme Court involved. The Supreme Court says it won't get, it will, it will not uh, take up the case. But finally, what kills it is not scholarly debate as to the wisdom of it, but because a smear campaign gets run in the American newspapers that attributes the whole purpose behind this as being nothing but a motive on the part of Andrew Carnegie to make a lot of money selling the new books that would be required if the system was adopted. Right. So the whole thing chokes and dies. Yes. Yes. Um, I, 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 I didn't know, I had no idea about all that, but, but it, it, uh, that sort of opposition is, yeah. um, that's, that's, uh, unfortunately, that's, that's not at all surprising. I mean, I think places where there were drastic reforms in, in, in spelling, um, usually um, it, it, it's connected to some major political upheaval. Right. Um, you know, after the Russian Revolution, there was, there was a, quite a, a substantial reform of, of the writing system there where they just got rid of some letters which, uh, you know, which weren't doing anything useful and were confusing, but... Uh, uh, but it was part of their political differentiation, not per se the separate intention to fix the writing system. No, no, they wanted to fix the writing system, I see. but okay. they, they could do it, they, they, they could do it, they could afford to do it because, you know, they were a new regime and they, you know, everything was different, everything... Uh, uh, that was Webster's logic for overhauling the spelling, breaking away from England in, uh, right. in his day, somewhat, right. yeah? Right, yes. And then uh, similarly, you know, the, the, the Turks after f the First World War, essentially they completely changed the system from, they switched from the Arabic uh, um, letters to, to the Latin uh, letters. Um, again, that, you know, was, that, that was uh, with uh, Ataturk, the, uh, uh, you know, complete break with the past, with the Ottoman Empire and, and the um, major political upheaval. Um, so in, in such in in, uh, uh, in such circumstances that at least you have a bit more of a chance um, for someone you know extremely strong figure perhaps to to um, to uh, force such a change. Um, otherwise, I mean in. in uh, uh, in some countries, you just have a, a long tradition of doing these things, and so each change is, is usually fairly minor. And and because because there's almost a tradition of, of change also in spelling, it doesn't seem like 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 a great upheaval. Um, and that's uh, Germany, certainly Germany and Holland and the Scandinavian countries. Are Some academy in France that functions like that periodically too, isn't there? Yes, except for the well, the French have haven't really, I mean, have hardly 
um, reformed anything. So French is, is uh, um, I think, is next, almost next, as bad as English. Yeah, I was going to say it's the next hardest <laughs> yes, in terms of yes. the complex confusions. Yes, yes. but, um, you know, in in, uh, in Holland, where I am now, I mean, they just also had a spelling reform a few years ago where they really just changed a few very minor things. Um, and there was there was very little opposition to that because it's, I mean, these these sort of small reforms are already, I mean, in themselves already a tradition. So right, they're accepted as part of the way things are. Yes. Rather yes. than being some effort that's uh, intruding on someone. Yes. Uh, yeah. Interesting, though, I mean, we go back to what we were saying about Deacon earlier and how the, the, the evolutionary dynamic in spoken language is in some respects constraining or conserving itself to be learnable by children yes. at a certain age, that same mechanism is in play but in an entirely different way here. You know? I mean, in that the, the levels of uh, illiteracy that we have um, relative to the learnability of the orthography by children doesn't, I mean, we wouldn't accept that. <laughs> I mean, the spoken language couldn't work the same way. No, no, because you can't get sort of, um, you know, you, you can't you, you can't get children who who can't speak the language. Yeah, um, that, they, they would. That, that that just wouldn't function. Um, whereas uh, children who can't read, um, uh, well, we count them in the in the tens of millions. Yes, and and uh, and. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, this, 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 you, you need a, a sociologist to to, um, to to think about, but why? I mean, uh, the fact that that uh, that is tolerated, um, and that is not. A, I mean, if if you if you um, put one against the other, the um, you know the the this inertia that we were talking about against the price that is paid for it. Um, and the uh, the fact that the that the the the, the price is felt as, as worth paying, or, or, or at least um, not uh, not not high enough for 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 changing things is, is I mean uh, right that's already I, a sociological question. There's not there's not a good ROI case that's come forth that's gotten past the inertia. That's for sure. Yes. And, and um, inside of that, there's a assumption that I think is only just beginning to free up a little bit, which is that, you know what, this, this writing system is a different class of invention. The, the writing system is a technological artifact yes. in a way that spoken language isn't. That's, that's, that's certainly true. Um, uh so we have a different responsibility to it. Um, uh, yes, I, I agree entirely. That's, that's, uh, um, in some sense, yes. I mean, uh, uh, well, even if, well, if, if you look thousands of years back, then, 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 then even I mean, writing also evolved much more gradually than, than um, most people uh, think. But, but. Uh, um, that doesn't change the basic fact that, that writing and the norms of written language are uh, uh, entirely conscious um, artifact. It, it is it is an invention in the completely traditional normal sense, um, and, and where spoken language is, is, a, is you know a different beast altogether. Right. Um, so so. Uh, 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 and even the fact that we that, that in, in, in you know that in 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 some societies there are um, debates about uh, changes in in in, uh, in the writing system and there are even institutionalized changes. Um, whereas you know just the idea that you could have an institutionalized change in the <laughs> spoken. in the spoken language is is fairly uh, fairly absurd. I mean it's true that there have been all these. Uh, uh, well, you know, in, in um, when was it? I think in in uh, in the 19th century, and then even in, in the during the First World War, in 
in in in, uh, in Germany, for example, there was people declared war on um, French loan words, and everyone saying things like "adieu" was was sort of frowned upon. And um, in some sense, you can call that some you know institutional change in 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 the spoken language. But it's that's that's uh, well, I mean. That that's fairly ridiculous. Right, uh, that was more a, a social uh, differentiation from yes, Frenchness. Yes, yes <laughs> precisely. Yeah. But if you know, uh, um, I mean, the idea that you can decide that from now on everyone is going to pronounce uh, the word hat as hit or something uh, because uh, of one reason or another is it, just, uh, it really is ridiculous. Um, whereas it's not, I mean, the, the idea that you can change the spelling convention isn't at all ridiculous. It's just, uh, um, just a matter of that it has some cost and some adjustment that has to go with it. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's, it's a purely, you know, political... Uh, Technocultural... Yes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's, 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 it's. Hmm. Um. The, um, we t one of the things we touched on and by the way, just I don't I do not want to abuse the privilege of your time. I'm so appreciative of our time, but I'm enjoying our conversation and, and would keep going as long as you feel okay with it. I know it's getting later where you are. Uh, yes, I think we know we could go on for a little longer. Okay. All right. Then you just give me the word and we'll put, bring this to a close because I I've gotten a lot out of our conversation that I think uh, is really you know, interesting and vital to the people that are tracking what we're doing. Um, excellent, excellent. Well, if, if you have any, you know, if you have anything more important than that, I'm happy to, I'm happy to go on or, or if, if we've sort of done most of it then. Well, the, the, the other thing that, that I wouldn't mind you, I would appreciate you um, touching on to whatever degree that you're comfortable with is um, back to some broader questions about the role of language in the course of human beingness. Mm -hmm. um, and we touched on this earlier. One has to do with the effect of the writing system on language, kind of what yeah. general statements we can make about that one. The other thing is, it seems to me that human beings cross this threshold, which we touched on, of becoming verbally self-reflexive. That. Mm -hmm that required that they be using words at a sufficient frequency, with sufficient frequency, with sufficient volume, that it, that they could, that it went from being a, an external instrumental uh, communication system to being this root of consciousness. Yes. And that <clears throat> anything that you have to say about those two poles are particularly interesting to me. Well, the second one is, uh, as I said, it's, it's uh, uh, undoubtedly <laughs> undoubtedly true, but it's very difficult to say anything about it because that happened a very long time ago. It appeared for which we have no, you know, no access. Um, it just must be that at some stage, as you say, that once language became somehow a sufficiently powerful tool. That it, it, it had a pro it, it, it must have appropriated the the process of thinking in in, in, in itself. Um, but uh, um, isn't that recapitulated, so to speak, in each child through their progression? Um, possibly, yes, yes, um, probably, in fact, yes. I, I, uh, um, I just think that's so interesting. It's where what you're describing at the core of your book about this being the greatest invention, or as we've discussed in the beginning, the invention that invented us. Yes. Um, it's it's where it gets its extra kick. What makes it, it you know so radically different than any other process yes. that's going yes. on is yes. when yes. it it becomes the the. the Foundation of an entirely different kind of consciousness. Yes. No. I, I, yes. I, I agree entirely. I suppose again, even with children, it's, uh, the problem is, of course, that until they speak, you can't really, you can't really ask them what they're thinking. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you, it, it's, it's, it, it, you know, it's. Uh, 
Yeah, okay, so it's, it, there's a limited place we can travel beyond acknowledging that it has that implicitly it has those kind of case. powers, yeah. yes. <laughs> but yes. we can't say much yes. more about it. Yes. With the other thing, I mean, that's a, that's a, there we are on, on, on um, uh, well, more secure ground, I suppose, because then uh, we are within the, I mean, you know, this is by definition the beginning of the historical period when, when writing starts and what it, uh, what, what it does to, um, well, if it's a spoken language. We, um, can, we can see uh, what must have been the trajectory of, of oral language shifting a bit in the ri written record of oral language. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's part of it. Um, and, uh, well, again, that's, that's a, um, well, the whole thing is, is extremely interesting, and, and uh, I suppose one could talk about it, uh, not just the whole night, but the whole <laughs> In fact, I have to, uh, I mean, this is something I'm, I'm, I've just started working on, on my next book, um, which will be on language and culture, and uh, write, I mean, what, what writing did to um, spoken language will, will be a, a, one of the, well, certainly one of the main themes that I will take up there. So, so uh, it's so so I, I I'm it, it's, so uh, so it's in line with your interest. Yeah, it's, it's a, of, yeah of, of extreme interest to me. But it's it's something that uh, uh, well, I mean, well, it's it, it, it's a um, you know, something that 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 many many pages uh, can and well, eventually will be written. Uh, Right, about, right. But, well, we'll but, come back to that then, I guess. <laughs> but uh, um, I think in I think there's I mean there's no question that that, that written language has um, affected quite profound changes um, in in the whole way we uh, we relate to to language, even to spoken language. And some of them, I think, are not at all positive, um, in in the sense that written language very quickly, in some well, it was usurped uh, spoken language and, as, as the as the real thing, so to speak. Right, right. Li the, it's literally true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the yes. the, imp imp the the imputation that that if it's written, it must be more so. Yes, because yeah. it's because it, you know because it, it's a permanent medium and and it, it, it quickly became the, um, to have uh, you know much higher prestige than the spoken medium because because of the, the way it is used for the purposes it is, is used um, and that has created this whole thing of spoken language of at least of uh, certain registers or certain kinds of, 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 of people, of literate people, um, trying to imitate uh, written language, trying to pretend it is um, more like written language. Um, uh, mean in their speech patterns? In their speech patterns, yes. yes. Um, and, uh, uh, um, and it has also created a sort of, you know, a fairly uneasy tension between, I mean, because we tend to think now of written language as the real thing, what was spoken language is, is just some sort of approximation to it. Um, there's always this tension between what we actually do when we speak, which is, uh, you know, something fairly different from, 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 the, from the conventions and, uh, of written language, and between what we think we do. Um, uh -huh. Uh, w w w you know, w w we are. W we tend to think that what what we ought to be doing is is essentially speak in a like we write. Well, maybe not exactly like we write, but but you know, in in, in, a, in a much closer way with with these sort of uh, perfectly formed sentences which begin in in the beginning and end in the end, and which have you know, w w which are grammatical and. Uh, uh, whereas when you look at, at real spoken language, it looks just completely different. That's, that's something that's, that's in, you know emerged in, only in the last I don't know ten twenty years, where, where, where people have 
started a linguist have started amassing these massive corporal or actual spoken language and and finally decided that it's it's worthwhile uh, looking at language as it is actually spoken um, and then they discover that the sticks are, are um, are really quite, you know, in, in, in uh, are quite different from... I would think it would reveal a, a natural elegance and beauty in the intelligence of its functioning that's of a deeper order than the conventions of writing, even though it has different utilities. Yes, yes. It, 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 um, it, it, it has different functions. It, it, uh, and... and uh, um, different means of achieving these functions, it's a different mode of communication, and uh, it's no wonder that, you know, the, it, it's done in, in quite uh, quite different ways. So, um, but but the, the, this prime, primacy of, of, of um, written language has, has, you know, fooled and probably is continuing to fool quite, quite a lot of people, including linguists, who who think of, you know, those um, perfectly formed sentences of written language as the real knowledge that we have of our language, whereas spoken language, you know, this is how Chomsky thinks of language and, and, and the, the whole Chomsky in school. Uh, so the real system of, of, of language we have in our mind is essentially that of written language of, of these sort of perfectly formed, dense, um, sentences, whereas, um, yes, in speech we have what, what he calls competence, that sort of, if we deviate from it, we never quite reach that ideal, but, uh, but, but the system of knowledge is, is based, that he claims we have in our brain, is based on, on, this sort of, on, the, on the written standard, um, and that just doesn't make sense. No, not, not especially when you start talking about how could universal grammar come from our own recent invention. Uh, well, yes, it's not Chomsky. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I tried so to. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 uh, so this, this, um, you know, the the, 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 what is perceived as the primacy of, of rich language really, I, I think, has had quite, quite um, negative effects on our on our understanding of what language I mean, of. of, of what we are actually doing and what it is that we know and what it is that what that's in our brain when we speak, um, uh, and uh, that's that's one aspect. And the other aspect is, I think, what you mentioned is it, it has actually had quite a substantial influence on the development of of spoken language again in various areas. Some uh, even on the you know on the level of sound. Certainly, there are many cases where we. Uh, now know that people have start, uh, a changed um, traditional pronunciation of certain words because they have, you know, they, 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 uh, to reflect more closely how how they're written. Yeah, uh, John Fisher makes the argument in his standardization of English that it's actually the writing system that creates, uh, you know, a conservative stability in the spoken system relative to its conventions. Otherwise, yes. there's no spoken, there's no standard in spoken language except that imposed by, by cultural acceptance of convention on the writing, from the writing system. Yes, I, 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 I think that's, that's, um, that's certainly going in the right, in the right direction mm -hmm. in, in terms of, uh, of, of uh, understanding, understanding how, um, uh, understanding these developments. Um, but also, I mean, it's not just on the level of sound. It's also on, on, on uh, um, the, you know, the level of, of um, syntax and, and uh, uh, practically all levels of language, really. Yeah, uh, that, that's what interests me. Is it seems that, that just like we were talking about self-reflexivity coming in when language crossed a certain threshold of complexity. I mean, even though we can't yeah. prove that or anything, we can. We can talk about that. That <clears throat> that writing allows language to stand still in front of us in a way that it doesn't otherwise naturally do. Yes. That gives us a uh, another level of 
distance and reflection that extends uh, the dimensionality of our abstract processing. Yes. And that that yes. in turn folds back to affect the differentiation oh, in language. Yes, <laughs> it's uh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly true. I mean, uh, um, there are things like, uh, um, you know, some things that we think of as, as completely obvious concepts, like like the concept of a word. Um, uh, you know, what can be more obvious than, than that? We know what a word is, um, but it turns out that we know that to a large extent because we have in, in our mind's eye a, a word written with sort of spaces either side of it. And there are some languages where it's invariably those that, that have never been written, um, right. where it's not at all obvious um, what a word is. There's no there's no distinction for that quantized separated unit. No, um, and even for linguists, it's not always obvious what are separate words, um, and 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 what is one word. Sometimes it really is. You know, it's just, I've I've uh, heard lectures and been to conferences where people have you know very very seriously and earnestly discussed that for a very long time, um, because there there were no obvious you know the, 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 the like the Greek writing, no space between. They all run together. And that the, that, that, you're, that the distinctions that you're making are yours. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so um, that's just a, a simple example of, of, of precisely what you were saying. That it's it's the it's the uh, well it's, it's sort of it's, uh, yeah a reflexive process in in that one you know the what 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 we see in 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 in. in uh, in, in written language, then sort of feeds back to what we think, what, you know, to how we perceive our um, our spoken language. Um, right. Well, fantastic. Thank you for your time so much. I mean, I could go on and on because I'm enjoying this so much. Perhaps we'll have another opportunity to do that. Um, in fact, I was wondering, maybe there, uh, if you come to the United States, I'd love to meet you and maybe do some of this on camera. And uh, if if there's a, do you, you work in conjunction with the university? Okay. Um, and not in, I, I, not in the United States. I work no. here in the university in, in Holland. But That's I'm, right. So they have a, do they have a good uh, media and television department there? I have no idea, to be honest. How about if I find out, and if they do, would you be interested in doing another conversation that we just touched on, sh a shorter one, touched on some of the things that we talked about today with them running the camera and um, and I arranging for them to be compensated by, by giving them other things that I'm doing that they might be interested in or whatever? Uh, yes, in theory, certainly. I mean, I don't, I mean, I'm, uh, I just can't, I, I'm not sure that it, um, you know, that they have, I, I'm not sure that uh, I mean European universities. I don't think are so advanced in, in, in this as, as um, American universities in in the, the whole media department. So okay. I'm not even sure that. They well, have I'll that. check into that. You needn't concern yourself. And to the extent that if there's something possible, then I'll get back in touch with you about the possibility of arranging it. Okay. Okay. Because I would I would love to do that, and we could be on the phone, and they could have the camera rolling, and I could tell them how I want it shot, and all of that, and that way. Some of your visual part of this could participate in our television series, in addition to the transcript of this appearing on the website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, in theory, that's enough. Okay. Well, thank you so much, sir. I really appreciate your time and your great work and uh, the kind of enlightenment you're helping bring into the world. Well, <laughs> well it really was my pleasure. Okay. okay. Take care of yourself. Good night. Good night.